So in a, in a situation like that, where the uh, irresistible force meets the uh, uh, immovable object, uh, somebody's going to get killed. January 2nd, 1932 was a Saturday. Herbert Hoover was beginning his final full year as President of the United States, and the St. Louis Cardinals were reigning world champions of baseball. German boxer Max Schmeling was the heavyweight champion of the world in the midst of a career driven by forces beyond his control. Bonnie and Clyde had not yet grabbed the focus of the nation, and Al Capone's criminal career was over while babyface Nelson would soon escape prison to resume his own. World War I had wiped away much of the economic security of the previous century, giving the Great Depression a healthy head start. By 1932, one of the only professions doing more business than before seemed to be law enforcement. Springfield, Missouri, and the outlying areas of Brookline, Republic, and Billings were not immune to this. Actually, the Depression hit the Ozarks a little bit earlier than that because there were actually the three anchors of the Ozarks economy for the last 30 or 40 years prior to that had been agriculture, mining, timber, and the railroad. All of those pretty well hit the skids in the 20s. The beginning of the Great Depression, you know, the Depression happened in 29, right after uh, Herbert Hoover was elected and uh, sworn in. He'd been president about well, it was just a matter of a few months when the depression hit and uh, you know it was so devastating across the entire country and uh, it was here in the Ozarks as well in Springfield and I think from what I've read and what I've heard my grandparents talk about things were really hard. During the 20s it was a pretty, pretty seriously depressed time in the Ozarks. Springfield itself kind of weathered the storm. Springfield has always been kind of a recession-proof uh, community. Uh, even, as you might notice right now, during the recession we've been in, it's kind of, you know, there's new construction going on and the unemployment rate is not quite as high. Uh, not to say things are good, but, you know, it's always kind of weathered the storm a little bit better maybe than some communities. But the outlying regions, the rural regions, which was obviously most of the Ozarks, uh, it was pretty pretty hard times during the 20s, and particularly the 30s. When I say this, I want to make sure you understand I'm not denigrating any law enforcement officers. I, I have the greatest respect for them, but the fact is is that uh, sometimes the law enforcement officers of this period of time were, uh, like I said, not that far removed. <laughs> in character-wise from some of the people they were chasing. That was not Marcel Hendricks. Marcel Hendricks was a good guy. Uh, he was a very well-respected farmer, very well-known in the community. And when he reached the age of 42, I guess he'd always had an ambition to be a sheriff. Sheriff is always considered to be the, the top elected official of the county. And so he ran for the sheriff's office and uh, won by a large, large, one of the biggest votes ever in the, what was called the Hoover Landslide and uh, became the sheriff of Green County. And like I said, he was a very active sheriff. A lot of sheriffs at this time, you know, delegated their authorities out to their deputies and they just kind of were administrative paperwork type people. Not Marcel. Marcel went on the raids. Uh, he was active. Uh, the, his deputies respected him. The people in the community respected him. And like I said, he was, he was one of the good guys. He was a, a, a very well-known person and very, very well respected. He was always in law enforcement, I know that. He had been a railroad detective <clears throat> and sheriff, uh, they called it uh, town marshal. marshal. Town marshal of He Ashgrove. was a town marshal of Ashgrove. Yeah. Uh, back in the, uh, I know he was there in 1920. We lived there in 1920. There's a little jail over at Ash Grove that I believe was functional at that time. My it has room. one room for the officer and one cell. That's yeah. still there. Uh, and then uh, I believe he also uh, had something at, at uh, Bolivar, didn't he? Um, I think he... I don't uh, have memory of that, but... But he was a railroad policeman also. Yeah. He, that's the first place he... I think that uh, he was really some sort of a policeman uh, at that point. 
He was a much respected law enforcement officer in the Ozarks. He had worked in Ash Grove and Bolivar for the city of Springfield. He was a Frisco detective and then a Greene County Sheriff's uh, deputy. And um, he had sort of phased out of some of the active work, but the, the uh, Greene County Sheriff often called upon Ollie to come and help him when he had some special investigation to do when something called for an extra special touch because he was so, just a great lawman, good thinker. You know, you had to be fearless to be a cop back then. There weren't a lot of uh, guidelines or policies or training and tactics or, or anything other than the public's expectation of that if there was a problem, you handled it. And uh, he was big and strong and uh, brave enough to handle this about anything that came along, from what I understand. Uh, Tony Oliver, let me, let me put it this way. When you watch one of these 30 gangsters movies and you see the big cop come in with the fedora and the suit and, uh, you know, getting ready to arrest somebody like James Cagney and, you know, Little Caesar, that was Tony Oliver. I mean, he was, he was a very, very respected law enforcement officer. He had a reputation of probably putting more people in prison than anybody in the state of Missouri. That, that actually was reported in the Springfield newspapers. Uh, he had just absolutely been involved for 25 years in law enforcement in Springfield and every large crime that had ever been committed he was right there involved in it and uh, he was he was your you know you can just see him with a big cigar in his mouth and that fedora pulled down mm -hmm. over his eyes and walking up a sidewalk and just you know I mean he was he was your prototypical big-time law enforcement officer you know and uh, there's one case he was particularly, uh, you know, noted for. There was a, uh, a maniacal man by the name of Dobbs had uh, taken some people hostage in Springfield. And he and another officer, a man by the name of, I think it was DeArmond, had arrived on the scene to arrest him. And actually, Dobbs killed DeArmond, you know, shot him and killed him. And Oliver single-handedly uh, rushed him took the gun away from him and subdued him. And uh, the story goes that Oliver had never been injured. Never. He had never never suffered one injury in 25 years of law enforcement. Wiley Mashburn. Wiley Mashburn was a character. But uh, I think he had had quite a bit of law enforcement experience for that time and place and had been uh, one of the sheriff's uh, most reliable deputies. Wiley had been a he was about the same age as, uh, you know, Marcel Hendricks, and I'm not going to say that he wore a black hat, but let, he definitely probably wore a gray hat. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. He uh, he had been in and out of different types of law enforcement for many, many years. Uh, kind of give you an idea of, of uh, maybe something about Wiley's character. Uh, and there was a very... Uh, serious recall election going on in Springfield uh, during the late 1920s. The mayor was under some uh, cloud of corruption and part of it had to do with uh, a lot of illegal brothels operating in Springfield, which was pretty common back in those days. And uh, one of them happened to be something called the New Central Hotel. And uh, one of the newspaper reporters happened to catch Wiley Mashburn uh, and ask him about it and Wiley told the newspaper reporter that he thought it was just much ado about nothing, it wasn't any big deal, they were really good people and didn't know why everybody was so upset. Well, needless to say, the mayor fired him, you know. Mm. Uh, and from that point, Wiley just kind of did different things for a while. Eventually, you know, he was hired by Marcel Hendricks as one of his main deputies because Wiley was absolutely fearless. I mean, uh, the, the story goes that he would tackle a buzzsaw. I mean, he was a huge man. He was about 6'4", uh, had really bright red hair, family man, you know, had, you know, wife, children. Uh, and so he was, you know, he was exactly the kind of deputy that Wiley, that uh, Marcel Hendricks would have wanted. I mean, he was, he was tough. That's all there is to it. Uh, he had had some dealings with the Youngs on several occasions. Uh, probably instrumental maybe in, in making uh, charges against Paul and Jennings, maybe even Harry. 
And uh, there's again all sorts of stories out there. I've interviewed some old timers that say they've overheard the boys say that, you know, they'd kill him, kill him if they ever got the chance. Uh, Sid Meadows was from Chadwick, Missouri. Uh, made his living for many, many years as a tie hacker, cutting out railroad ties out of you know timber. And of course, when the timber industry fell apart, uh, when the railroad industry fell apart, uh, he lost a job, didn't have anything to do, moved to Springfield, tried to better himself. And uh, again, big guy, you know, really big, probably 6'3", six, 6'4", six, big, strong, muscular type guy, gentle giant. Uh, everybody said he was just like a big old teddy bear, really. But he was, you know, he was impressive looking and he was strong. And so someone said, hey, you ought to go be a law enforcement officer. Got hired on, you know, with the Springfield PD and uh, eventually, you know, worked his way up. And uh, again, was uh, just a very well-respected, very well-liked man. Uh, well, probably one of the most popular men on the force at that time. With about six months experience, Charlie Hauser was a rookie at the Springfield Police Department. He worked the jobs he was given, driving the paddy wagon or working the front desk. Eventually, he worked his way up to being a patrol driver on the night shift. Uh, he was a jokester. He was uh, he had had a lot of tragedy in his family. He had lost his parents, his grandparents, and a brother all in the flu, in uh, the pandemic flu of World War One. And then just recently, he had lost another brother that he was very close to, I believe, in an automobile accident. And so he had a lot of tragedy in his family, but he kind of compensated that for being kind of the the jokester of the of the uh, squad, and uh, he was always cracking jokes, and you know he was again very popular with the officers. They really liked him, even though he was a young rookie. Almost from the first, I mean, even when we was little shavers, we was pretty thick with each other. Whenever we could, we would ride together over the hills and near the pretty creeks in Christian County. My parents never objected to having me go with him, and as we grew older and went higher up in school, we was free to do almost as we pleased. My folks knew Jim was a little gentleman, and his folks knew I was always a little lady, and they never cared how much we was together. Willie Florence Young on her courtship with James David well, there's there's no doubt that in the beginning JD was the dominant. You know, he was he was the male. You know, and during this time, the male was always the you know the dominant figure of the family, or generally. And uh, Willie was the uh, you know she was the dutiful wife, and uh, you know he ran the family, and you know he was definitely the most uh, important contribution, particularly with the the six oldest kids. But uh, apparently. Uh, he did not begin to exert quite as much influence on the family uprearing out west as, as perhaps Willie Florence did. And again, that uh, probably had something to do with this image that, you know, has come down of Willie being this Ma Barker-like character, you know. And uh, I think she probably became more involved in the child rearing and the family uh, involvement at, with the younger kids probably because J.D. was getting up in years. Uh, he was not a healthy man. You know, he had begun to, you know, he'd worked really, really hard all of his life on the farm and his health began to kind of break. And as that happens, and sometimes the mother takes over, you know, some of the big duties. And I think that probably happened when they moved out west in Oklahoma. Well, I don't think she was, she wasn't too well liked, I don't think, but uh, her husband was. Well, from what I remember reading and hearing, he uh, was a pious man and and God-fearing and had a large family. And I suppose that if you have a large enough family, you're going to have kids that are following in their parents' footsteps and, and you're going to have some that are I suppose you could characterize him as black sheep. I know that was the case with Pretty Boy Floyd, uh, who was a pretty ruthless bank robber of that era. And uh, his brother was a sheriff in Oklahoma. So I 
I suppose that he tried to raise his family the best he could and, and make a living on a farm in, in the middle of the Great Depression, but he had some boys that didn't, didn't follow his footsteps. The family eventually sold the farm uh, that they'd purchased and uh, raised most of their oldest kids on in the Richwood Valley. And uh, I'm not for sure why. Uh, story goes that they had some relatives that moved out in the western part of Oklahoma and uh, they made the move in 1901. Uh, it may have been maybe the soil kind of dried up where they were. Uh, it was kind of, remember, we had a really bad depression in 1893 and uh, another one in the late 1890s. And it could be, you know, they got in financial trouble, you know. But for whatever reason, they didn't make a move in 1901 out to uh, the western part of Oklahoma uh, in Tillman County. Um, which was towards the panhandle and a uh, far different world than what they'd been accustomed to. Uh, this was still almost like Indian territory. It was the last remnants of the Wild West. You know, a lot of people don't realize this. The Wild West didn't end in Arizona with the gunfight at the OK and Corral and all. It ended in the Indian territory. And uh, it, that was a, it was probably a pretty wild place that they moved their family to. And they got out there, it was dry, the dirt was red clay, uh, hot, wasn't anything at all like they had been used to at all. On top of that, uh, apparently the Youngs, and particularly Willie, didn't assimilate with the natives very well. Uh, she, I don't know if she had a higher opinion of herself and her family than maybe they uh, their surrounding neighbors or what, but apparently there was some conflict between her and, and uh, the young kind of were considered to be kind of aloof and kind of, you know, uh, not part of the, the community. But again, I'm not for sure that I could blame her for that because actually getting her children out there and realizing what kind of environment they would brought them into, it may have been one that they had regrets once they got out there. But they stayed for 15 years, you know. They stayed out in the western part of Oklahoma for 15 years and tried to make a go on this land. And that's where Harry, uh, Jennings, Paul, Lorena, and Benita basically came of age. You know, the five youngest children. Uh, that kind of explains probably to some degree, uh, there's a lot of uh, people that say it's almost like they raised two families. The eldest six, you know, and the younger five. There just was a lot of difference between them. Um, the kids, the older six, were all pretty successful. You know, uh, some of them went to college, became businessmen. In fact, uh, I've read, and I'm, I'm assuming it's true, that every one of the 11 children except Harry actually graduated from high school. And now, I know that may sound like not a big deal. you got to remember, this is the Ozarks, turn of the century. That was a big deal, <laughs> you know. Uh, for for kids to graduate from high school, any kid to graduate from high school, let alone 10 of your 11 children to graduate from high school. Uh, like I said, some of them actually went to college. I think Paul actually went to college for a little bit. Um, most of them turned out to be farmers and housewives and, you know, like I said, some of the older ones, I think Jared, who was kind of the, the oldest son and he was the, you know, cream of the crop. He became a pretty successful businessman, I believe, in Arkansas. But uh, the young, the five youngest, uh, they were raised up in a different environment than the other six, and that probably did have some contribution to uh, the fact that they kind of maybe took a little bit different path than the, than the other siblings did. They were like a lot of people in that time. Uh, they had an association with firearms because growing up on a farm, you used a firearm to hunt to supplement the uh, diet. I'm sure that they probably ate quite a bit of wild game and people who lived in rural areas as they do today uh, need a gun for self-protection around the house. Uh, by all accounts, Harry wasn't a very well young man. Uh, he uh, suffered a lot of illnesses uh, when he was a young kid. Uh, you know, he's, I'm not going to say he was, uh, I think Woodside described him as runny and ratty. Uh, that's probably not true. He was he was just, you know, he was a sickly young kid. You know, he probably wasn't as healthy. Uh, 
the sisters, even Lorena and Vanita, who were actually younger than him, helped take care of him. Uh, there's one story uh, goes that uh, the mother told that when he was 13 years old, he slipped and fell on some ice, hurt his head real bad, uh, started having seizures, uh, went into all sorts of uh, problems, and uh, you know they had the, the doctors couldn't do anything with him. They called the preacher in because they thought he was going to die and. The mother says they had to sing Rock of Ages, you know, to keep him calm and all this. But even the sisters, Lorena and Benita in jail, said, <laughs> not true, that didn't happen. The end is, you know, we, I think we all understand better now concussions and what can happen to a person's emotional, you know, uh, situation. But I seriously doubt that it had any impact if it indeed even happened, you know. Uh, a lot of people said he was insane. I, I don't think he was insane. I think he was just mean. <laughs> you know, I think he just grew up mean. You know, that's all there is to it. I think probably they just missed the Green Hills and the cooler temperatures of the Ozarks. And, you know, western Oklahoma is kind of a hostile environment, particularly if you're not used to it. And uh, I think probably they just tired of it. Again, J.D. was in failing health, and he was not as capable of dealing with the farm as he had been, you know, in the past. And I think they knew that they, you know, he he couldn't handle the farm anymore. Uh, I think probably J.D. probably wanted to get his sons and his youngest daughters away from the environment. Maybe he finally realized that hey, this is not good. Things aren't going right. Uh, there's no evidence that Paul and Jennings or Harry got into serious problems out in western Oklahoma. But no doubt, J.D. probably saw things coming that he felt like perhaps he needed to get them out of there before it got too late. Well, I think there was a lot of petty theft involved and there was a lot of theft from the railroad. There was something about them breaking into boxcars and stealing and they fenced goods, uh, stolen goods for other people. I don't know how old they were or how many years they lived there, the Youngs, but uh, not very many years, I don't think. But as I say, enough of our sales uh, brother, Lillard Hendricks, lived just up the road a ways from the Youngs. And mm -hmm. uh, he thought he was a fine man, the dad. And I remember a friend of mine went to school at Brick, and she went home to stay all night with the Youngs one night. And the, the girl, young girls, took her upstairs and she said, Dad, you never saw so many bicycles. That whole upstairs was full of bicycles. Her, the girl that was staying all night, her dad said, you just better keep quiet. I don't think she stayed anymore after that. <laughs> My uncle, Molly, had, had arrested him on two of those boys at one time. I believe it was Harry and Jenny. Uh, for stealing her dad's own grain. Now, I'm not sure if it was wheat or corn or something. Really? Or oats. But he arrested them and their dad wouldn't file charges. And they never was uh, convicted of anything. Yeah, I, uh, I imagine they had an in for Ollie uh, on account of the previous arrest. And uh, I imagine he kept an eye on him after that. Pretty well. They uh, remember Jennings, Paul, and Harry grew up in Indian Territory. At, they were the last remnants of the Wild West, and guns were <laughs> that was a way of life. You didn't you didn't exist out in Western Oklahoma at the turn of the century without a gun, and uh, they became extremely proficient in uh, the use of guns. And again, not untypical. You know, I mean, this was very typical of any you know. Uh, Hillboy, you know, that grew up. I, I could tell you stories of my dad uh, who died in the early 70s, who was sick, and that guy could still shoot truer than anybody I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it amazed me. I remember uh, going somewhere with him one time, and he was took a rifle with him and took some aim, and I mean, he was very sick, and I could not believe his ability to shoot a gun, even at that age, you know, and, and as sick as he was. So there's no doubt that uh, Harry Jennings and Paul grew up in a gun environment 
and were very proficient with them. There's the stories, of course, the turkey shoot stories that say that they got banned from the turkey shoots because they were so good. Uh, who knows? You know, they were all pretty good. That was pretty typical back in those days. I I don't know that they were any better or any worse than anybody else, but they uh, they definitely knew how to how to use guns. There's no doubt about that. Uh, once they got back to Springfield, uh, Jennings and Paul got got pretty busy. <laughs> you know, uh, they uh, they weren't very work brittle. Uh, that's a term that you know a lot of the old timers used. You know, they didn't they didn't much like to farm, and uh, they kind of decided that they wanted to uh, maybe make a life doing some other things. So they started their life of crime. Uh, in December 14th, 1918, they burglarized uh, three different stores. Uh, they burglarized the Bingham Hardware Store, the Ozark Mercantile, and the Efton Hawkins Hardware Store in Nixa, all in one night. And, uh, you know, they were eventually caught, you know, and both of them pled guilty. And in 1919, they were sentenced to four years uh, for larceny and six years for burglary in Jefferson City, Missouri. You know, so they were sent up to prison in 1919. Mm -hmm. uh, at this time, Harry, you know, was kind of on the periphery. He was still pretty young, and uh, there's no indication that he actually was involved too much in it. I'm sure he knew about it. I'm sure he looked up to his brothers. You know, but there's no indication at that time that Harry. He, he was still pretty much a, a child at this time. Jennings and Paul were quite a few years older than he was. Uh, J.D. was heartbroken over all this. Uh, like I said, the boys went back to prison and went to prison in 1919. Uh, it wasn't long after that that J.D. died. Uh, and again, the story goes that uh, you know the boys, you know, didn't get back in time for the funeral. They wanted to be excused. You know, they wanted to be, you know let Adam mercy leave, you know, to let him go to attend the funeral, and the, they didn't get there in time. And J.D., you know, there's no doubt that he died to some degree of a broken heart. You know, that's what some of the family members said. He was just devastated over the fact that his sons, had, t some of them had turned out to be they were, the way they were. And, uh, you know, because that was, that was not him. But, uh, you know, he died, uh, you know, and the boys, you know, didn't get back in time, that's for sure. You know, for the funeral. Uh, by the way, they were released about a year later uh, by the governor. Uh, apparently, at some degree, at the request of the mother, she said she needed help on the farm. Yeah, and she pleaded with the governor and sent petition after petition, and the governor finally did release them in 1922. Uh, gave them an early parole so they could go back to work on the farm, which obviously they didn't. By this time, Harry, you know, by this time Harry's not just a kid anymore. Harry's a young man now. And he kind of becomes involved with the Young Brothers Triumvirate. That's what it was called. That's what it's uh, referred to in the newspapers, you know. And they be kind of become the, the gang of three, you know. And uh, he's kind of learning from the brothers now. They apparently had some associations, uh, whether it's just alleged, I don't think any of it's been proven, but there there has been some allegations over the years that they had an association in some degree with uh, Pretty Boy Floyd and maybe even uh, Babyface Nelson or, you know, they, they tried to link them to all the notorious crime figures of, of the day, but uh, they, they did a lot of a lot of stealing from boxcars and petty theft, and apparently were stealing automobiles. I've always said that if you weren't a good criminal when you went to prison in the 1920s and 30s, you probably were when you got out, you know, mm. because, uh, and Missouri State Penitentiary, by the way, had a horrible reputation. It was one of the absolute worst prisons in America during the 1920s and 30s. Uh, I mean, it, you know, there were a lot of places you could survive you know, but Missouri State Penitentiary was tough. I'm telling you, if you went to the Missouri State Pen in the 1920s, early 30s, and you came out of there, uh, you were going to be you were going to be either tough or broken, one of the two. It was it was that bad. You know, a lot of torture. Um, you know, things. Uh, the guards were extremely vicious, and they they maintained 
control by violence. That's all there is to it. So, and again, that probably had something to do with the way that you know the boys developed. You know, once they served their prison terms in the Missouri State Pen. Uh, you know, both Paul and Jenny and Harry did serve more terms in prison. Uh, Paul made a move to uh, Texas independently in the 19, I think around 1923, probably, uh, I don't know if he moved to get away from his two brothers or he moved, uh, one of the others, two of the other sisters had moved down there and gotten married, uh, but he moved to Texas and uh, once he got down there he uh, burglarized a house and uh, pled guilty ended up going to uh, you know Huntsville Texas which again just right on par with the Missouri State Pen that's the, that's the uh, prison where uh, you know Clyde Barrel you know supposedly cut his toes off to keep from you know uh, you know doing uh, the prison work details there's all, all sorts of rumors that Clyde Barrow and uh, Paul knew each other. That's not true. Barrow wasn't in prison at the same time as uh, you know as Paul, but no doubt that they probably suffered some of the same situations. That, you know, but he served about three years in uh, Huntsville, Texas, during this period of time from about 1923 to about 1926. Jennings, a little bit more serious. Jennings, not too long after he got out of prison, uh, got caught uh, burglarizing a Frisco railroad car. And he was charged with federal crime, um, and he ended up going to Leavenworth, you know, federal penitentiary for three years. And uh, so both he and Paul uh, were in prison not too long after they got out the first time. Harry kind of was on his own at this time, and uh, you know, he uh, he wasn't as good as his brothers. <laughs> uh, you know, Harry's got this reputation as being the mastermind, you know, the, the Jesse James to the Frank James. That's probably not true. Jennings was the Jennings was the key to all this. But uh, Harry wasn't that good a thief by himself. Uh, he got involved in the 19, or mid-1920s with some other local youths, uh, a kid by the name of Tudor, another one by the name of Tinsley. Uh, and they started burglarizing, and boy did they burglarize. They burglarized in, uh, they burglarized the city service gas station. Uh, they stole some property from a man by the name of Glenn Mason in Republic. Uh, they stole a car from a Joe Kramer in Republic. Uh, they burglarized the uh, Shackleford Cafe in Republic. <laughs> they, like, they like to pick on Republic, apparently. And, uh, you know, eventually he got caught for all these, you know. Um, and some of the other two that he was involved in turned evidence on him and they got lighter sentences and in turn you know Harry ended up getting the big sentence and he gets sentenced in 1925 to the Missouri State Pen on, on his own so he goes to prison in 1925 uh, now again you get all these stories about how he got up there and he was a tough guy you know and all this and uh, the uh, you know he you know he was real you know uh, mean and all this. I don't think that's true at all. Uh, I've read newspaper reports from guards that were worked at the time up there that they interviewed, and they said actually he did everything he could to keep away from the general population. He was almost like a trustee. Uh, they worked out on the farm more than anything else because frankly the other prisoners didn't like him. Um, you know he was you know. He just wasn't a very well-liked young man by the other prisoners. He did meet, there's no doubt about this, he did meet Pretty Boy Floyd at this time in the Missouri State Pen. I'm not going to say they were good friends or anything like this, but they were acquaintances. And uh, Floyd did know the family, and Floyd did visit the farm after the massacre took place. He no doubt uh, probably suffered a lot, you know, during his prison term, even though he was kept away from the general population, uh, you know, he wasn't a, Harry, I don't think, was quite as tough as everybody portrays him as being. You know, I think he was more braggadocio than anything else. I think he probably liked to act tough than, and oftentimes got himself in situations he couldn't get himself out of, which is exactly what happened with Mark Nell. Harry was released from prison in 1928 and likely resumed his criminal activities. Without the guidance of his older brothers, Paul and Jennings, who were in prison, 
Harry probably wasn't quite as active. Tony Stevenson points out that Harry was always popular with women, but with the added allure of being an ex-con, young men in the Brookline area began showing him admiration. After a night of drinking in Billings, a small town adjacent to Republic, Harry and a friend decided to drive into Republic to see if anyone was looking for Harry for a crime he was suspected to be involved in. As Harry drunkenly drove down Main Street in Republic, he garnered the attention of town marshal Mark No. Well, Mark Noe was a uh, the town marshal of Republic. Uh, now, that in itself doesn't mean he was a really law enforcement officer. You got to understand something about town marshals at this time for little small communities. They were more like uh, night watchmen. Uh, they checked businesses at night to make sure that they were locked up. Uh, they handled things for the county sheriff that were not too serious until the county sheriff could deal with it. Uh, he did have a gun, obviously. Uh, I don't know that he had ever used it before, you know, or ever even pulled it before. Uh, he was a well-respected man in the community, owned a hardware store. That was his day job. Mm. And, uh, you know, like I said, he wasn't really a trained law enforcement officer per se. He was more kind of like a uh, someone to just keep the peace until the sheriff or his deputies could arrive on the scene. Um, he married, uh, lived right off Main Street, uh, did not have any children. Uh, and like I said, he was considered uh, kind of one of the pillars of the community, a very respected man in the community. He, from what I've read, he comes across as a very typical small town law enforcement officer who uh, pretty much knew the people he served and they knew him. In the spring of 1929, Harry and another youth for the public man by the name of Ori LaFollette. Uh, Orville, actually, but everybody called him Ori. And Ori and him had met up and went to Billings and uh, were doing some drinking, you know, uh, pretty typical. And they got, you know, got pretty tight, got pretty intoxicated. And Harry wanted to come back to Republic. And uh, he had been kind of suspicious in another burglary and he kind of said I just want to just try to drive around and see if you know see if anybody you know does anything. Oh, I know that Marshall No got in the car with Harry which is just incredible now to think about it because that wouldn't happen today. It wouldn't happen 20 years ago or 40 years ago but in that day apparently Marshall No knew Harry and had dealt with his fair share of drunks I presume and uh, so he gets in the car with Harry, and then Harry shoots him. Mark No, you know, basically tells Harry, you know, that, you know, give him his gun, that, you know, he's going to have to pinch him, you know, and take him to the justice peace. At this point, Harry pulls out the gun, reaches over, and shoots Mark No. Uh, again, I'm not sure if that's the chest wound that he got or the head wound, but uh, a little confusion. People out, the, you know, there's people out on the streets, they hear this, but frankly, they don't know. It's kind of dark, and they don't know for sure if what has happened. Uh, remember, all these old cars backfired all the time. The car starts up, kind of jerks and all, and, and heads south, pardon me, north on Main Street to about the uh, where the uh, funeral home is now on Main Street, and stops again. Another gunshot rings out. This was the second shot. Apparently, you know, Mark No was struggling during this time, and that's what Ori LaFollette says. He's struggling over, you know, Ori trying to get the gun away from him. He's not dead yet. And uh, Harry shoots him for the second time. Well, Ori, man, he's petrified because Ori's not, you know, he's not a real criminal. You know, Ori's just a typical kind of wild, rambunctious young kid who's enamored with, you know, this persona of Harry Young and he's absolutely petrified so he crawls out from underneath you know uh, Mark No and takes off he jumps out of the car and takes off running into the shadows and uh, you know Harry Young proceeds north out of town you know well by this time you know people have figured out hey we got something going on here you know and uh, somebody goes to Kerr's house to make sure to see if they had actually got to Kerr's house. And Kerr says, I don't know what you're talking about. He's the justice piece. I haven't seen anybody. So they get on the phone. They call Marcel Hendricks, you know, the sheriff. And they say, Marcel, we got a problem, you know. Uh, Harry Young, we're pretty sure, just maybe shot Mark Noe and took off. And uh, we don't know where Noe is or Mark, or, you know, or uh, 
Harry Young. So, you know, the sheriff gets up, gets one of his deputies, they come to Republic. And they start searching the town, trying to find him. And by this time, a lot of the citizens in the community, they join in together and they start searching around. They finally come up with Ori. You know, he's at one of his uh, relatives' house hiding. And uh, he gives up. You know, he said, man, you know, I said, I don't, I don't know what happened here. You know, uh, and they take him into custody and he tells them exactly what happened. You know, he tells them all about the situation, doesn't lie about it. Um, tells them, as far as he knows, Harry was renting a room in Springfield. They go to the rooming house. Uh, the guy says, yeah, he was here a little bit earlier. Uh, got some clothes, took off. He was obviously drunk, you know. Uh, I don't know anything about him, you know, where he's gone or anything. Well, uh, they decide that they're going to go to the farm. But the sheriff says, you know, we're going to wait till daybreak. You know, it's dark out there. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want anybody getting hurt here. You know, he's already possibly killed, you know, shot, you know, the town marshal. I don't want to get any of my deputies killed. So he said, we're going to wait till daybreak. And so they do. They wait till daybreak, and um, they go out to the farm. They find nothing. You know, he's not there or nothing. About the same time that they're out there, uh, a couple of, uh, you know, civilians are driving from Brookline to Republic, kind of halfway between Billings and Republic. Well, they spot what looks like a body in the ditch. Uh, one of the civilians happened to be Lillard Hendricks, who is Marcel's brother, who lived, you know, right in that vicinity. And so they get out, and they go over and they look, and sure, Lillard recognizes him immediately. He said, oh my gosh, you know, that's Mark Mill, you know. I mean, someone's killed him. So they go back to the farm, and uh, Lillard's got a phone. He calls his brother and says, hey, you know, I found, found Mark Mill. Here's where he's at. So they all come rushing out to the scene, you know, and... Uh, they do a preliminary search and find out, you know, obviously he's dead and uh, take his body. And they begin a real search now for Harry Young. Uh, wasn't too long after that that the report came in that uh, they found some clothing, bloody clothing dumped around uh, Route 66 in Halltown. And uh, they took the clothing, they got the clothing, took it back to uh, the rooming house guy and he identified it said, yeah, that's that the clothing Harry had on, you know, last night, you know. And so, you know, there's little doubt at this point that Harry Young, you know, has killed Mark No. Uh, <clears throat> or he'll follow, you know, eyewitness testimony. They got his bloody clothes. They got the body. So Harry Young <clears throat> is charged with the murder of Mark No, and he becomes a wanted man. Now, this is the first really serious crime any of these boys have done. You know, when I say serious, I'm talking about violent crime. You know, they had burglarized, they had stolen, you know, all this kind of stuff. But they had never, as far as anyone knew, ever injured anybody. But all of a sudden, you know, Harry Young is cop killer now. After the killing of Mark No, Harry Young is on the run. Harry's brothers, Paul and Jennings, are now operating out of Houston, Texas, and Harry goes to join them. Earning the name the Young Triumvirate, the three brothers began a car theft ring that the FBI considered one of the largest in the nation. In a time when honesty was the main deterrent to stealing a car, the Young's family business thrived. They would steal cars in Missouri and sell them in Texas and Oklahoma, steal cars in Texas to sell them in Missouri, and so on. It's likely that at least some of Paul Jennings and Harry's siblings knew what they were doing, and that even Willie Florence had an idea of what was going on, but Woodside pointed out that none of them made any attempt to turn the brothers in. Meanwhile, Chef Marcel Hendricks was watching Greene County for signs of Harry's presence. The brothers would make frequent but short trips to the Brookline farm to visit their mother, but while tips do come in, Hendricks was never able to catch them. Towards the fall of 1931, Hendricks finally decides to kind of shift tactics, and he decides that he's going to let it be known that he's kind of given up. Yeah. And so he kind of puts the word out on the streets and he says, you know, hey, Harry's never going to come back here. I know that, you know. This kid's too smart for that, you know. And so he kind of basically puts the word out that he's almost kind of given up the search for Harry Young in hopes that that will lure Harry back to Missouri, which is exactly what happened. Well, apparently they went to sell a car, and the dealer thought there was something not right with this deal they were proposing, so he contacted the chief of police in Springfield, 
and that's when they decided to hold these women for questioning and and uh, came to the conclusion that the young boys would be out at the farm. In 1931, Jennings, Harriet, Lorena, and her husband decided to make the drive from Houston, Texas to Brookline, Missouri to visit Willie Florence and Vanita for Christmas. They made the drive in two stolen cars. They stayed at the farm for a couple of days before deciding to sell one of the cars and move on. After a failed attempt by Jennings and Harry in Aurora, they decided to send their sisters, Lorena and Vanita, to Springfield to make the sale. The car dealer knows the sisters, so he says the title isn't right but for them to return the next day, New Year's Day, 1932. The car dealer calls Virgil Johnson, head of auto thefts for Springfield. Johnson is skeptical the girls will return the following day, but says to call if they do. The sisters do return, with the title corrected by the practiced hands of their brothers. Sure enough, next day, here comes Lorena and Vanita, back in again, same car, title straightened up this time, and the guy, he's having to think fast. He's saying, what am I going to do now? So he says, girls, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, I don't have any money. It's New Year's Day, you know? I shouldn't even be here. You know, I just happened to be, come in, you know, I just, you know, I forgot it's New Year's Day and I don't have any cash. You know, uh, you're going to have to come back tomorrow, Saturday the 2nd. You come back tomorrow, I'll give you $250 for this car. And that's a pretty good price. And the girl said, oh, okay. Lorena and Benita show back up. They had brought in uh, Lorena's husband and Mrs. Uh, Willie Florence. And they had all met at Jennings's ex-wife's house. Uh, Jennings had been trying to get back together. He had been he had married a woman in Springfield, and they had divorced after all of his prison terms. And they had been trying to get him back together. Uh, and there's a the story goes that um, Willie Florence was trying to, you know, reconcile the two and trying to get him back together because she didn't, you know, she didn't believe in divorce and all that, and she was trying to get it. So uh, she. And uh, the uh, little girl, uh, Lorena, and her husband's little girl stays at the, you know, Jennings ex-wife's house, trying to talk her into kind of reconciling. Lorena and Benita uh, go off to the used car dealership to sell a car. Albert, her husband, Lorena's husband, goes to get a haircut. Well, they show up at the car dealership around three o'clock, and Virgil Johnson and one of his partners is waiting for him and they immediately arrest him. But anyway, they definitely got the information pretty darn fast, matter of minutes. It didn't take hours for him to get the information. And the information that the girls gave him was that Harry and Jennings alone were at the farm. Nobody else was out there. I, w I liked four weeks of being eight years old when that happened. So you can imagine an eight-year-old boy. But I remember well the night it happened. Virgil Johnson informs Tony Oliver and Marcel Hendricks is quickly alerted. The decision to form a raiding party to arrest Jennings and Harry is made. The raiding party included Virgil Johnson, Ben Billiou, Tony Oliver, Marcel Hendricks, Wiley Mashburn, Charlie Hauser, Sid Meadows, and Ollie Crosswhite. Soon after the raiding party departed, Frank Pike and Owen Brown returned to the station and found out what was going on. They asked Chief Waddle if they could join the raiding party, and he agreed. As Pike and Brown moved quickly to follow after the two cars, a citizen named R.G. Wegman wanted to ride along. Eleven men in three cars made their way to the Young's farm. The first eight were the ones that were in the original raiding party. And then Frank Pike and Owen Brown come on the scene just a little bit later. And they're joined by a civilian a man by the name of Wegman. He was just one of these kind of police station groupies that kind of hung around just, you know, police station and you know they said hey you want to go with us arrest some bad guy and he said sure you know but he was sort of one of these uh, oh you might call him a cop groupie that liked to hang out at the police station and got to know several of the officers and uh, there have always been people like that in law enforcement than there are to this day you know people wanting entertainment would do things like this and so they they discussed going out there and decided who was going to go and how many cars they were going to go in and and this uh, this fella accompanied them out to the uh, massacre, and I think once things went bad, uh, the ones that had decided he could go along wished they hadn't. Well, Ollie had just sat down for a lunch of ham and beans, which was one of his favorite. 
So they were just going to recruit Ollie, who was a former law enforcement officer, to help them go out and just talk the boys out of the house peacefully, come with us, let's get this settled. And so Ollie didn't get to touch his ham and beans, and he had to get up and grab his gun and went out to help them. And, and one of the cars pulled up to the north in the lane, the other one approaches from the south and drives up to the front of the house. And they kind of, those eight kind of meet up there. At the same time, probably a couple of minutes later, here comes Frank Pike and Owen Brown and the Wegman civilian. And they're charging up the lane in their car, you know, like gangbusters, you know. Uh, and of course it kind of scares the other officers at first. They get like, this, you know, who's this? This the Young Brothers or what, you know. Well, come find out it's just three, you know, two other officers and a civilian. So you got 11 people actually meet out front of the house. The officers, of course, knew the Young Brothers as kind of local hoodlums. They had a rap sheet, but they were still local boys. And so they thought, we'll just go out to the farm, talk to them, have them come out of the house. Come on, boys, you know, let's, let's go to the police station and settle this. Let's get this over with. They, so they didn't come with any reinforcements. They had their own guns. Everything I've read uh, indicates that Sheriff Hendricks was a neighbor of the Young family and considered them to be friends, even, even the uh, boys. I don't think he really expected them, once he arrived with that many officers on scene, to fight. They arrived and the sheriff wanted to basically have it set up so that nobody could escape the house and farm. And I think he really expected them to give up without a fight. Uh, Hendricks was supposed to be to know their dad real well. He didn't think they'd cause any problems, but uh, he took a load, two, lo two car loads of officers with him anyway. That was hard for me to understand, and he didn't think there was going to be any problem with it. Anyway, that, that was one of the stories that was out there. I, it didn't really tally up to me after I got older. Marcel Hendricks maybe thought that, you know, it wasn't a big deal, because Marcel told everybody, he said, oh, since they're here, they're just going to give up. There's no big deal. You know, they like me, they trust me. You know, I'll be able to talk them out. Well, Cross, White, and Mashburn said, no, they won't come out. Well, no, they wouldn't. Not when they saw Cross, White, and Mashburn. And Oliver wasn't to that agreement, too. He said, no, I said, sure, if you're wrong. You know, they, these guys are, you know, they're not going to give up. But they uh, they just all kind of float around the house. Uh, supposedly, uh, you know, they try skeleton keys in the door and can't find anything. They circle the house looking in the windows. They don't see anything. They knock on the door. Hey, come out. If anybody's in there, come on out, you know, and give up. And all this time here in Jennings are sitting inside the house loaded for bear. Uh, one of them has a uh, automatic shotgun and the other one has a uh, automatic pump rifle. Sheriff Hendricks positioned the officers around the house and Virgil Johnson fired a tear gas canister into an upstairs window in the front of the house, which had little, if any, effect. With the other officers situated throughout the yard, Marcel Hendricks, Wiley Mashburn, and Virgil Johnson moved to the back of the house to break in through the kitchen door. Now, this is where some controversy takes place. Frank Pock swears and swore to his dying day that he went back to the back kitchen along with uh, Wiley, Mashburn, and Hendricks to make the uh, actual charge into the house. Uh, every indication is that's not the case. Every indication is it was Virgil Johnson that went back there. Virgil Johnson had a tear gas gun. Uh, brand new to the police department. Uh, he had already logged one tear gas canister up to one of the upstairs bedroom windows and it went in and nothing had happened. The story goes that Pike, he swears up and down. I mean, I can show you interview after interview he gave with newspaper reporters, magazines for years that says that he was back at the back door. Uh, that's probably not the case. Pike was probably back behind another tree, back behind actually where Sid Meadows was on the north side of the house. So you've got Wiley Mashburn, you've got Marcel Hendricks and Virgil Johnson with a tear gas gun 
by a south kitchen door and that's where they're going to make their entry you know they're going to bust into that door and they're going to you know go into the house while the other ones are kind of keeping guard you know to make sure that nobody escapes uh, this is where the shooting starts uh, Hendricks and Mashburn hit the kitchen door with their shoulders and uh, they kind of bounce back and at that point the door opens and Mashburn is carrying a shotgun or pardon me a, a handgun none, none of them have any long rifles or long guns he's carrying a handgun and he immediately is hit right in the face with a shotgun blast a shotgun blast point blank range 12 gauge shotgun blast is going to I mean it do unbelievable damage and it just literally lifted him off his feet and just propelled him back about 15 foot into this stack of firewood uh, you know Oliver of course is screaming Henrik says oh my god you know they've shot Wiley Henrik goes charging in the front door the kitchen door and he's met by a shotgun blast you know to the chest Wiley Mashburn was lying helpless outside the back of the house but would survive for several hours Marcel Hendricks fell to one knee and, according to Woodside, tried raising his gun but couldn't due to the torn muscle tissue on that side of his body. Woodside goes on to write that Hendricks then rose and stumbled into the house where he died of internal and external hemorrhages that took some time. Tony Oliver was able to see what was happening from his vantage point and as Virgil Johnson rushed toward the front of the house, Oliver, now the ranking officer, called for Johnson to fire the second canister. The canister missed the window and fell uselessly outside the house. So he comes running to the front of the house and Oliver yells at him to shoot, you know, shoot the tear gas gun into the front window. So he turns around and shoots it, but it bounces off the roof, you know. And he runs back towards where Baloo and Wegman are by the car. You know, because by this time, gunshots are ringing out. You know, somebody inside the house now is shooting back. You know, besides the shotgun blast in the kitchen, you got people shooting out the front, one of the lower front room windows and, and the upper bedroom window that, that hadn't been tear gassed. You know, it's just pandemonium. You know, uh, Oliver's take, he, he's taking charge because he's the only officer, basically, he's the ranking officer now. And so he's screaming at his officers to shoot him, kill him, you know, and they're just shooting like crazy. The problem is they all have just handguns and they didn't come out there prepared for this. They didn't have a lot of ammunition. They didn't have any rifles, they didn't have any shotguns. You know, other than the tear gas gun, none of the officers that went out on this raid carried anything other than a revolver. And a revolver is a fine piece of equipment to defend yourself at close range against a uh, sudden threat, but if you know you're going to go into a gunfight, take the most gun you can take. Take a shotgun, take a rifle, take something that you can uh, deliver effective fire at long range, hopefully out of the range of your adversary. At this point, Ollie Crosswhite, remember Ollie's on the north side of the house with Owen Brown. Ollie decides he's going to run around to the back and circle back behind the house and he's going to come into the kitchen. And so Ollie takes off running back behind the house and when he gets back behind the house, there's an old sod cellar that sits back away from the back of the house. And he gets, he's running behind the sod cellar when somebody takes a shot at him from the upstairs back bedroom. And so he jumps down and somebody keeps shooting at him and, and again Oliver can see the very edge of this from his vantage point. He can see the sod cellar and he can see Ollie's kind of bent over and Ollie's hat goes flying off. Well he assumes Ollie's been shot. And he says, oh my god, now they killed Ollie. You know. And so Ollie's pinned down. He's not, he's not hit yet. He's just pinned down. But uh, Oliver doesn't know this. And so he, you know, but this time Oliver, you know, he's, he knows the situation's really serious. Oliver called out to Virgil Johnson to return to Springfield and inform Chief of Police Ed Waddle what had happened and return immediately with reinforcements, guns, and ammunition. As Johnson was pulling away under fire, Detective Ben Villeu and Wegman, the civilian, jumped into the car to escape with him. Uh, in between time, Oliver's kind of trying to keep everybody alive. Uh, First thing is Owen Brown, who's now left beside beside himself back on the north side of the house. He decides he's out of money, he's out of ammunition. He'd already shot all of his bullets, so he decided to run north across the yard, jumps a barbed wire fence, and then runs kind of east along the barbed wire fence to a tree back where Frank Pike is. 
kind of away from the distance. And uh, so he does this. Then Oliver realizes that Hauser is in a very vulnerable position. Charlie Hauser's right in front of the house behind a very small tree. And poor old Charlie, you know, he's out of bullets. You know, he has no bullets left. He's already shot his, you know, bullets off. And so he says, Charlie, you got to get out of there. He yells at him, said, get out from behind that tree and get back. Get some better cover. So Charlie, you know, who's trying to make himself look small, kind of leans over and kind of looks back at the house right between the eyes. Yeah. One of the boys, when one of the, you know, one of the guns shoots him right between the eyes with the rifle. And he falls down. The uh, coroner said he's probably dead when he hit the ground. Because Meadows is the closest to the house, and Meadows is a big guy. And he's he can't make himself small enough to stay hidden behind the tree. And so Oliver tells him, said, Sid, you've got to get out of there. They're going to kill you. And so Sid has got his hands in his coat pockets looking for bullets thinking maybe I've got a spare bullet here somewhere. And he does the same thing Hauser does. He kind of turns his head to look around to see if it's safe to run right between the eyes. When they found him, still had his hands in his pockets. Well, that leaves Owen Brown, Frank Pike, and Tony Oliver. Well, Pike and uh, Brown are quite a ways away from the house. You know, they're out of bullets, but they're quite a ways away from the house. Oliver's pretty close to the house, so they turn their attention to Oliver. You know, and the, and the you know, guys that are doing the shooting in the house start just literally just chewing the bark off the tree, trying to shoot Oliver because he's a big guy too, and he's and sure enough they finally catch him in the shoulder. Spins him around away from the tree, and he's staggering towards the one remaining vehicle, trying to get to the vehicle to hide behind it when they shoot him in the back, and he goes down. You know, and it kills him. So now all you got left is Brown and Pike. Now at this point everything went quiet. And Frank Pike and Owen Brown both said that somebody hollered out from the house said, Okay guys, put your guns down and come up to the front of the house. Well, Pike always said, I may have been scared, but I wasn't totally stupid. He said, There's no way I was gonna do that. And so they take off running east through the cornfield and uh Bullets are firing after him. Pike actually gets a couple, you know, superficial wounds. Brown doesn't get any, you know, and they run as fast as they can till they get out of range of the bullets. They run about 250 yards down to, you know, the farm road, you know. Uh, by this time, it's getting dark. Uh, the day, by the way, I didn't really tell you, but there was snow on the ground. It was cold. It was, you know, second day of January. It was in the 30s. Uh, it was overcast. And by this time, you know, it was probably about probably about 4.30 in the afternoon. It started getting really, really dark at this time. And, uh, you know, that's basically where the shootout ends, per se. Uh, the only one left living is all across Crosswalk. You know, nobody knows for sure what happened. But speculation is that somebody kept him, was keeping him pinned down the whole time from this back upstairs bedroom. Somebody walked out the kitchen door of a shotgun, walked right up behind him, and literally put the shotgun almost point blank to his head and just literally blew his head off. You know, just literally almost decapitated him. You know, uh, there was no love loss between Ollie Crosswhite and Wiley Mashburn and these guys. I mean, they, they hated each other, apparently, a lot. By that time, reinforcements are showing up. And uh, they were saying, you know, you guys, it's, you know, it's crazy up there. It's getting darker, and nobody knows what to do. Remember, nobody's in charge. The sheriff is dead. The chief of detectives is dead. The police chief is in Springfield. He doesn't come out there. You know, police chief, he's he's staying in Springfield to coordinate, <laughs> you know, which is probably a wise thing on his part. Uh, he's calling the governor, you know, wanting the National Guard out. He's calling... You know, for an airplane with bombs. I mean, I'm serious. You know, it, I mean, this was a, you know, they realized they had a real situation on their hands. And so uh, it takes about a half an hour of waiting down at the crossroads for anybody to do anything. In this between time, civilians are showing up, farmers, you know, uh, you know, anybody and everybody. Words already all around, all over the Brookline area and the Springfield area, what's happened, you know, to the, you know, 
telephone, you know, that you know, been a great big shootout. We lived on a farm north of Oliver, and uh, we had an old telephone that hung on the wall. And when uh, the telephone, everybody had a different ring, but when the telephone rang, about everybody went to the phone. <laughs> Listen, yeah. But anyway, uh, we just got through eating our supper, as we called it. And I had one brother who was younger than me. And, me and, the, and the, the phone hung on the wall between the living room and the kitchen. And uh, we, me and my dad and my, my brother and I went in the living room. And the mother was cleaning up the kitchen. The telephone rang, and my dad answered it, got up and answered it. And as an eight-year-old boy, I can remember the look on his face. And he turned around and he told my mother, he said, I'm going to Springfield. Holly just got killed. It's a newspaper reporter that kind of sets the thing in motion. A guy by the name of Lon Scott. Lon Scott had been trained in World War One to assault uh, positions. And so he says, guys, we need to get up there and find out what's going on. So he enlists the help of another one of the officers, and they go and start creeping up in the cornfield from the south and west of the farm. By this time, it's getting dark. You know, it's, it's pretty much dark. And they're just kind of crawling on their hands and knees, and it's a long, elaborate story that Lon Scott tells later on in the Springfield newspapers. But basically, they approached the farmhouse from the west. Lon Scott and his and the guy that was with him, they hear something, and it's kind of like a moaning. And they're like, you know, talking to each other in low terms. They say, what is that? And they said, well, we don't know. It's coming from that wood pile over there. So they don't know what exactly it is, but they finally get up enough courage to run over there to the wood pile. And in the darkness, they can see this figure just leaning, sitting up against the wood pile, and he's got his hands, they said, just kind of rubbing his face like this, and just moaning. And all they could see was this shock of red hair. Well, Lon Scott immediately recognized it as Wiley Mashburn, because Wiley had just, just big, huge red hair. And um, he said, oh my God, it's Wiley Mashburn. And so they jump up, and they start hollering down at to the people say, come up here, Wiley Mashburn's here, he's still alive. Well, everybody down there like, yeah, all right, you know, they think it's the Youngs trying to lure him up here. Well, finally, Lon convinces them, you know, you got to get up here, guys. So, finally, people start coming up, and by this time, there's ambulances on the scene, and the ambulances start rushing up to the scene, and they immediately pick up Wiley, who's still alive. I mean, this has been like probably now two hours after he was shot, and he's still alive somehow, even though he took this 12-gauge you know, round right to his face, almost point-blank range, just literally destroyed his face. They load him into the ambulance, and they rush him back to Springfield, to the old Springfield Baptist Hospital. But Mashburns actually gets to the Springfield Baptist Hospital, and according to reports, he actually got up off the cot and tried to walk into the operating room. Uh, my dad told me that uh, he, he went in with Hendricks to the kitchen door and uh, they shot the water part of his face off. And that they brought him into the hospital, the little Baptist hospital, and he stood up and unbuckled his belt buckle for him. And later on he passed away. My dad told me that. I mean, I don't know how this guy did I mean, you talk about one tough man. He must have been one of the toughest men that ever lived. And finally, he falls over and dies of shock, you know, loss of blood. You know, he never makes it to the operating room, you know. But he, uh, you know, for him to even survive that long was just, to me, is un just unbelievable. It's, uh, it tells me how, how tough a guy this guy really was. And they went out there with uh, a posse and the National Guard went out there. That was probably the surest way of ensuring that uh, the evidence was trampled and moved and
destroyed and in disarray. But, uh, I, you know, it's hard to say. I know that uh, when I was a young officer at the Sheriff's Department, uh, another uh, deputy and I took an interest in this case and thought, well, heck, we work here. Let's see what records, if any, we can find. Are there any reports from the time or, or uh, court records? And we couldn't locate any. Uh, Cecil McBride was one of the officers that arrived on the scene. And uh, they had kind of approached the big old barn that sat out to the north of the place. Still sits there. You know, the barn still stands. And, uh, you know, the story goes that McBride was kind of left alone to guard the barn at one point, And that he hears uh, noises coming from the barn. And he hears dogs moving back and forth. You know, and somebody hollering at the dogs. And he supposedly hollers at them to stop, you know, and you know, don't go anywhere, and somebody kind of puts their hand out like this from one of the doors, he says, from the door of the barn, and he shoots at the hand, and he says, I plugged it right between the hands, said, I saw it, said, I, I saw the bullet, you know, and says he shot him right in the palm of the hand. Um, story goes that he, uh, you know, runs back down, gets reinforcements, you know, tell everybody what he's done, they all kind of, like, yeah, right, Cecil just seen ghosts, you know. But they all go back up, they search the barn, they find nothing. This is what we know for sure. About 8 o'clock Saturday night, a Ford car was stolen from Commercial Street, you know. And that car was eventually the car that Harry and Jennings wrecked outside of Dallas, Texas the next afternoon. So somehow between around 4.30 at 8 o'clock, you know, Harry and Jennings made their way to Springfield. They stole the car from Commercial Street and they took off, you know, towards Houston, Texas, because that's where they were headed. And so the rest of Saturday night, you know, it's just, like I said, it's pandemonium at the farm, you know. I mean, nobody's really in charge. It's just kind of a wild scene. Uh, they're driving down a road by a man by the name of Carroll's Farm, H.D. Carroll, and they either fall asleep, they lose control or something, and they go off into the ditch, you know. And old Mr. Carroll, he sees them. You know, he's a farmer and he sees them, so he kind of gets on his team of horses and he drives his wagon over and he says, boy, what happened? They, they're they crawling out. He said, man, they were really, they had soot all over them. They were grimy. And they said, oh, man, we've been driving all night, you know, and said, we just fell asleep and wrecked our car. And he said, well, you're going to have to have somebody look at the car because it definitely wrecked. And they said, well, we're going to walk on down to the next town and find a mechanic. And do you mind, we don't want anybody to steal our car, do you mind hooking up your team of horses and pulling it into your, your barn? And he said, sure, I'll do that. He does see the rifle and the shotgun that was used in the massacre. Doesn't think anything about it. This is Texas, you know, 1932, you know, everybody's got guns. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't think anything about it. But one of the daughters says, Dad, did you notice they took their license plate off before you got out there? And he said, no. So he goes back out there and he, you know, sure enough, they had taken the front license plate off and threw it off the ditch. So he picks it up and uh, he carries it into the house. Doesn't think too much about it for a while. But after a little while, the boys don't come back. And he said, you know, they should be back by now. So he gets a little scared. He's thinking, man, I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to steal this car. You know, I'm a good honest man. So he calls the sheriff's office and he tells the sheriff, you know, he gets hold of the sheriff and he tells him what's happened. The sheriff says, ah, said they, Mr. Carroll said, nobody, everybody knows you're not a car thief. He said, don't worry about it. That would have been the end of that story right there. You know, but thank God for busybody telephone operators <laughs> because the telephone operator you know it's back in these days when Ethel listens in on the telephone you know she's she's you know got the telephone headsets you know and she's listening to everybody's conversation she hears all this and so she goes home that night and her son her 16 year old son is sitting by the radio listening to KMO, KMOX radio out of St. Louis that's the biggest radio station in the United States at that time and I mean, all, I mean, it's non-stop, the Missouri Killers. I mean, it's, all it's talking about is how these two brothers have killed these six law enforcement officers in Springfield, Missouri. 
And so, you know, she begins to tell her son about what, you know, some of the things she had overheard today, and she tells him this story. And he says, Mom, I bet that was those boys. And she said, oh, and she says, I bet it was. So he gets on the telephone and calls the sheriff, of course, of Canna County, you know, we're outside of Dallas, and he says, can you give me the license number? And he says, well, yeah. So he gives him the license number. He said, what's going on? And he said, well, I, said, I think that may have been those two guys from Missouri. And the sheriff, I'm not sure he even knew what he's talking about. And he said, well, okay. So the 16-year-old boy then calls the prosecutor of Greene County, a man by the name of Dan D. Somehow gets a hold of him, who's kind of now, by this time, you know, taking charge of the investigation. Gets a hold of him and says, hey, let me tell you this story down here. So he tells him the story about the two guns. He tells him the story about the license plate, description of the guys, and he just thinks, you know, hey, this makes sense. He spends Sunday night trying to trace down the license number, and sure enough, traces it back to the car that was stolen off Commercial Street. And he said, aha, you know, I got a stolen car from Commercial Street with two guys in it matching Harry and Jenny's description. So then he gets a hold of a Texas Ranger, and he says, I want those guns. And so Texas Ranger goes out to the farm, gets the two guns, gets on an airplane, they fly him back to Springfield by Monday morning. And so Nee uh, calls the uh, Smith & Wesson, I think they were both Smith & Wesson uh, factory in uh, back, back east, gives them the serial numbers, they trace them back to the McGregor Hardware in Springfield, Missouri. Both guns shown listed as being sold to Oscar Young. Uh, Monday night, Harry and Jennings show up to a rooming house owned by a man by the name of Mr. Tomlinson. So anyway, they pay him for a room, and so about midnight, and they go back and they take the back bedroom and they close the door and apparently go to bed. Mr. Tomlinson, in between time, picks up the newspaper that he's reading, opens it up, and right on the front page is the big story of the day, the fact that, you know, they're looking for these Missouri killers in Houston, Texas, and they've got Harry and Jenny and Paul's picture on the front page. And he said, oh, gosh, <laughs> you know, i got two of these culprits back here in my back bedroom. Hmm. So he doesn't really know what to do. He's scared to death. You know, he's scared if he does anything too upset, he know they'll kill him. He doesn't do much that night. Uh, he decides, you know, the best thing to do is just basically just kind of play it by ear and try to get out somehow the next morning. So he stays awake basically the whole night. The next morning, knocks on the door and he tells the boys, he says, hey, uh, I'm going to walk my little girl to school. You know, it's not a real great neighborhood, you know. And they say, sure. And uh, in between time, I think my wife's going to go get some breakfast food for you. And so uh, he uses that ruse to get his daughter and his wife out of the house and leaves the boys sleeping in the back bedroom. In between time, after he leaves the house, he hightails it over to the local police department and basically gets hold of the chief police and tells them what he's got going. And after a few minutes, they, he actually convinces them that he's got Harry and Jenny Jung in his back bedroom. They brought uh, enough guys with enough guns and the right kind of guns and tear gas that uh, there wasn't any way the young brothers were gonna get out of there. I think that uh, those Texas officers were just as determined to get uh, Harry and Jennings as Harry and Jennings were determined never to go back to jail. So in a, in a situation like that, where the uh, irresistible force meets the uh, uh, immovable object, uh, somebody's going to get killed. And they've got submachine guns, they've got long rifles, I mean they are loaded. These guys are professional, big-time city police officers. On top of that, these guys are already, you know, they're they're prolific cop killers now. They've killed six police officers, seven if you count Mark Noy. So they, about 10 o'clock that morning, Tuesday morning, they sneak up on the house, and they start sneaking into the house, and uh, apparently the story goes that the back bedroom opens up, one of the two brothers looks out, sees the officers coming down the hall, slams the door after he pops off a couple of shots, 
slams the doors, and then the next thing they hear is the boys yelling, come get us, we're dead. And they hear two gunshots ring out. The officers bust open the door, and Harry and Jennings, according to the officers, are laying on the bed dead. And uh, it was a pretty rough going. Back then, uh, those fellows didn't have pensions or anything to compensate for their widows and all. Uh, like they do now, and I'm thankful. But it was pretty rough going for her and her children. And we all helped out. Some of them would stay in the summertime, come down to the farm and stay with us. But she raised them. It had to be devastating to all the families, and it, it was for the whole community. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if it still holds a record, but one time the biggest funeral in Springfield was the one for Sheriff Hendricks, and uh, just an outpouring of grief and sympathy for the family. Uh, I think, uh, at least for the sheriff and some of the officers, the uh, funeral services costs were donated by the funeral homes, the burial plots. My only memory is being on the stairway with my brothers and sisters and um, we were curious because a lot of people were coming into the house and someone told us to go back upstairs that, um, that someone would be up to talk to us later. I don't remember who came up but that's the only memory I have of that day. I remember uh as an eight-year-old, uh, when they had the, they had the services there in the old church, which is still standing, but uh, when people marched around to view the body, there were several different men. I don't know how many. Maybe maybe I saw as many as three or four. Hand my ethical money. And I, I saw it. I've never seen that before, you know. We didn't have any, uh, I think there was some money that may have helped her with the burial expenses. But uh, outside of the government program, which came in some at some point, must have been after that, because uh, it was, I'm sure it was an FDR program, uh, uh, which I told, told you about a while ago. But other than that, <coughs> She worked outside the home some. She was always there, as I remembered, when I went always, to school in the morning, and, always and there, there when, when I got home, home in the afternoon. But <laughs> she cleaned houses for people. She took in washings and ironings. She, she uh, at one point, she cooked all the pies for Newberry's uh, dime store downtown. She was a great cook, uh, and uh, I guess those are the three things she did basically. I think I remember had any other and job. She was resourceful. She had, she had lived, um, you know, the, the kind of life that teaches you to do everything. So we always had a garden, and we had a cow, and we had chickens, and, uh, you know, that gives you a lot of food. And mm -hmm. I can always remember during those years that we lived where there was an alley behind our house, and there were a lot of transits in those days or you called them hobos in those days. And uh, they would come by and mother would always feed them, even though she was trying to feed all of us. So, yeah. Well, we had we had some older brothers uh, too. Yeah, they And were. an older sister, and I, I guess our oldest brother was about 15 or 16 at the time. They worked. And all of the, all of the kids uh, tried to help support the family, basically. Uh, we went to work early uh, at, at small jobs and whatever we could do. I mowed yards and I babysat. And she and babysat and my older brothers, uh, one of them worked on a farm. He used to plow all day long, he said, for I think 50 cents and found, which means they brought him a bucket of beans in the field and he took a cup and ate beans while he was plowing. and. Uh, as we got a little bit older, of course, uh, we helped more, and uh, so it was a family effort. It wasn't just mom, but she was she was a good manager, so she made a dollar stretch 
very far. Money was a lot different back then. You know, fifty cents a dollar, two dollars was a lot more money than it is today. That's no money today. But back yeah. then, you um, you, you <clears throat> survived. And as I said, the Crosswhite family were very very good to us. I had an aunt Ona, whose fa father-in-law had a grocery store, and um, I'm sure Aunt Oni gave us the things that mother couldn't grow in the garden a lot of times, you know. So well, then we, we, had some, <clears throat> we had some aunts or, and uncles, I guess, on my dad's side that Always. farmed. So we got some mm -hmm. help from them. Uh, uh, you know, if, if they butchered a hog or something, why well, we might get some some of that, and uh, mm -hmm. so the the family helped out a lot on my mom on my dad's side, and uh, that was uh, we had uh, he was <clears throat> one of thirteen children or twelve, mm -hmm. twelve I guess. My mother was the last of thirteen children, but he was one of twelve children, and eight we had eight aunts and two uncles uh, who were still living when he died, and they gave us a lot of help and. Uh, yeah. So we managed. I don't remember ever feeling like I was poor. We weren't, and you uh, know we had a happy childhood. Uh, with uh, with Charlie Hauser, here he's he has a wife, a woman he's told everybody is his wife, and then when it comes time for her to get whatever death benefits he had coming, they weren't actually married. She couldn't produce a marriage certificate, and she didn't get anything. Of course, the sheriff's wife, as was customary in that day and time, uh, if the sheriff died in office, uh, the community and political leadership felt like, uh, well, we've got to we've got to do something for this man's wife and family. So she was appointed sheriff and served out the rest of his term, um, and would have been able to live in the sheriff's residence there at the jail and and have that income. Of course, it uh, I don't know if it inspired his son or or. But uh, his son Glenn followed in his footsteps and became sheriff of Greene County. She had what Nell and Joe called her cry box, and it was an old Chesterfield cigarette box. And in it, she would keep clippings of poems that she had. She had lost a daughter. Um, she and Ollie had lost a little girl to diphtheria, and so she had a lock of the little girl's hair in the box. She had letters from prison from one of her older sons who was in prison in Oregon, I believe, for, um, for a, a crime that he was accused of. He was later released, but she had letters from him. She had the lock of hair from the daughter. And then she had just poems. And she would, um, when the, the kids had gone to bed at night or when they were getting ready for bed and she was alone by herself, Nell said that her mother would take out this cry box and open it up and start reading the poems and reading all the clippings in there and begin to cry. And that was the only time she ever saw her mother cry is when she opened the box and then reminisced and, and, and read things that touched her. And that's when she kind of let down and cried. So I don't think her mother called it the cry box, but the children called it her cry box. They actually raised like $11,000, which was a huge amount of money back in those days. Uh, they divided the money out between some of the widows. Uh, Mrs. Hendricks refused it. She said, I don't need it. By the way, Miss Hendricks was uh, appointed the acting sheriff. Uh, you know, that was not uncommon for the widow of a slain, you know, sheriff to become the next sheriff. And so she actually became the sheriff of Greene County until the next election. And the next election, uh, Curtis, the constable that kind of took charge at the scene that night that I told you about, he actually wins the election, becomes the next, you know, sheriff of Greene County. But she refuses any money. Uh, Crosswhite, Mashburn, Meadows, uh, they all get a pension. The kind of sad deal about the whole thing was uh, Charlie Hauser's widow. Uh, she applies for the pension. And his brother, his living brother, Charlie's only living brother, files suit in Joplin that she is not entitled to any reward money or pension money because they were not legally married. And come find out that they they never were legally married. So she gets nothing. Yeah, she, uh, she just left out in the cold. Kind of a sad situation, you know. 
as far as the surviving officers, uh, Owen Brown uh, pretty well just goes on. He becomes later on involved with uh, law enforcement, I believe. He, he works for the uh, Missouri State Prison System for quite a while. Virgil Johnson, uh, probably of all the survivors, had the roughest time. Virgil was, was always a real quiet, religious man, and this really shook him to the core. Uh, and Virgil uh, just really had a hard time after this. Uh, you know, he, he stayed off and on in law enforcement and all, but it, he was never quite the same person. You know, he was, he was always a nervous person anyway, and apparently, and, and this really, he struggled with this. Uh, Wegman, the civilian, disappeared. <laughs> I'm telling you, the night he returned to Springfield is the last word you get on that guy. You, I've, I've searched newspaper articles and everything. He, he absolutely disappeared. I, ben Blue. Poor old Ben Blue. Uh, <laughs> ben was a character. Uh, ben had had quite a few run-ins with law enforcement prior to being a Greene County deputy back in Christian County. Uh, in fact, he was uh, actually charged with some, some pretty serious crimes as a young man. And uh, he was eventually found innocent and, uh, you know, let off. And he, that's it. he was employed by the Greene County Sheriff's Department. A year after the massacre, when they're kind of recapitulating everything, Ben Ballou was apparently in prison for liquor violation. <laughs> I don't know what kind or what he was involved in, but that's the way it was reported in the Springfield newspapers. After that, he apparently is released or, or found innocent or whatever, and he comes back and he goes back to work for the Springfield, uh, for the Greene County Sheriff's Department. Now, Frank Pike is the enigma in this whole story to me. Um, Frank Pike lived to 1981. Uh, he lived a lot longer than any of the other survivors. Uh, he had a long career uh, doing all sorts of crazy things. It was reported he was, he played in an orchestra, he he worked for, uh, you know, law enforcement in different capacities. Finally ended up working for Springfield City Utilities for city for several years, and I believe that's actually, he died still employed with Springfield City Utilities doing some maintenance work on parking meters or water meters or something, you know. But he never shied away from telling the story. You know, Johnson and Brown and these other guys, you know, they didn't like to talk about it. You know, they very seldom talked or gave interviews. Frank Pike would talk to anybody, you know, and did. And I've got magazine articles, men's magazine, bias magazine, uh, several different magazine articles where he gave interviews. And uh, I don't know how to put this delicately. Uh, it seems like Frank's uh, story became a little bit more embellished every time he told it. Uh, which, you know, again, that's understandable. He was the last living survivor, and, you know, he, he survived a horrific incident. And who's to say the story he told isn't true? I'm not going to sit there and say it's not true. But, you know, all I know is it does seem to be there's several inconsistencies with his versions of the stories as he told them over the years. So he's kind of an enigma. You know, it's hard, it's hard to sort through the, filter through the fact and the legend when it comes to Frank. Uh, one thing is for sure, he probably kept the story alive. Had it not been for him, I think the story would have died a long time before, you know, uh, it, you know, a long time ago because he just, you know, he refused to let it die. And he wanted people to know about it and he wanted to keep it alive. And, and I think he deserves a lot of credit for that, you know. Um, a lot of grief in Springfield. A lot of people upset. Uh, of course, now you got to deal with Harry and Jennings. Uh, there was a reward offered, and for them to pay the reward, their bodies had to be brought back to Springfield. That didn't go over well at all. Uh, the mother was adamant that they be brought back and buried with their father out at Macaulay Cemetery. Uh, between Joplin, uh, between uh, Nixon and Ozark. Uh, the sisters, Lorena and Benita, and uh, some of the other sisters, Florence down in Houston, said, no way, bury them in Texas, get it over with. But the mother actually, she had control of the situation, so she signs a paper 
and where basically she orders that the bodies be brought back to Springfield for burial. And so this becomes almost like a three-ring circus. It takes several days to get the bodies back to the Springfield area because there's floods on the Mississippi and out in Texas and Oklahoma and so they have to kind of go kind of around different uh, ways than they normally would have gone. Uh, the bystanders, of course, every, every town they stopped at, people knew who they were and they were trying to get into the ambulance, take pictures of the bodies and look at them and stuff like this. And so it becomes kind of a three-ring circuit. They finally get them into uh, Pittsburgh, Kansas. And by this time, the situation in Springfield is so bad. You know, it's been several days now, and the people in Springfield have worked them up and themselves up into a frenzy. I mean, you've got hundreds, thousands of people congregating on the square at night, basically threatening that if they bring these bodies back to Springfield, they're going to do all sorts of bad things to them, you know. And so they actually put them in a warehouse, a cold storage warehouse, the two bodies. And the ambulance driver comes back to Springfield and says, what do you want me to do? He said, you know, what, what, what am I supposed to do with these two bodies now? Well, the authorities finally decide the only way to handle this is get them to the Green County line, identify them, fingerprint them, take them back to Joplin and bury them in an unmarked grave. And so that's exactly what happens. Since that time, somebody has put a little tombstone on the grave side. Uh, and, you know, you can go to Joplin and find a cemetery and there's actually a little tombstone that says Harry and Jenny is young now. Uh, by the way, I have to tell you that there's an old rumor that that's not where they're really buried. Uh, the rumor is that they actually were later on uh, dug up month or two later, uh, taken to Macaulay Cemetery and buried in unmarked graves there. And uh, if you were to go to this Macaulay Cemetery, you can see where Willie Florence and J.D. are buried. And right next to them is obviously part of the family plot. And uh, there's, there's no gravestones there, but there's a couple little cement blocks with Y on it. Paul's an interesting story. Uh, Paul was finally gave himself up a couple of days after Harry and Jennings died. Uh, he he was wanted for the massacre because they didn't know for sure if he was there or not, and so he uh, he gave himself up to authorities in Houston, Texas, and uh, he was never charged with the, any event in the massacre because he had an alibi, and uh, there was no evidence placing him in the, the farm. Lorena and Benita and Oscar all said he wasn't there. Uh, and there was no physical evidence to place him there. And like I said, he did have an alibi that seemed to be rather reasonable. And so they didn't charge him with that, but they did charge him with uh, several counts of auto theft. He goes back to prison for several years, gets out, and eventually uh, is caught again, this time stealing from, I believe, a post office. Goes back to Leavenworth again for a while and eventually gets out in the late 1930s and from that point on, as, at least as far as anybody knows, uh, he never was involved in crime again. He died in 1985. He actually lived to be quite an old man. Unraveling truth from false rumors and speculation is difficult. Questions remain. Jennings and Harry fired shot after shot from inside the house, yet officers found only five spent rifle cartridges in a single shotgun shell. What happened to the other cartridges is unknown. Were the officers facing more than just Jennings and Harry that day in 1932? Investigators at the time were not in agreement over the question, citing a bullet wound on Sid Meadows and Tony Oliver that did not seem to come from either of the two guns Jennings and Harry used. Some believed evidence in nearby trees, along with the missing shells, suggests the brothers were helped by a third gunman. I've always suspicioned that there was somebody else in the farmhouse. This is, this is just me now, this is just my speculation. I find it hard to understand how uh, two men could have done all the shooting that took place. Not that they weren't capable of killing the you know six police officers, but I find it hard to believe that somebody was shooting from the downstairs front bedroom window, the upstairs front bedroom window, the kitchen, and the back you know upstairs bedroom. Now you know that doesn't mean they couldn't have been doing some running back and forth, you know, and all this and. And apparently that's the accepted version of the massacre. I find that a little hard to believe. I 
Frank Pike, it was, it was brought up to him, and he said, I couldn't tell you for sure, but he said it seemed like there was more than two. But he said, uh, to be honest, I couldn't tell you because I never saw him. Uh, there was one credible eyewitness report that placed the boys uh, in Pitcher, Oklahoma about midnight Saturday night after the massacre. And the story goes that they made it to Pitcher, Oklahoma, which is about four miles away from here, and uh, placed them there about midnight, which would have been about approximately the right time from the time they stole the car on Commercial Street to the time they got to Pitcher, Oklahoma. And the story goes that they did, that the clerk of a little all-night grocery store identified Harry and Jennings but said there was also another man and woman in another car, you know, that was traveling with them. And he didn't get a good look at them, but they were definitely traveling together. And they got out and came in the store together and, and all, but he couldn't identify them. So I have a funny feeling there was somebody else in the house. Was it Paul? I don't know. When Jennings and Harry realized the home they were in was surrounded by Texas law officers, did they choose to kill one another rather than be taken in alive? This is a question with less uncertainty than others. In fact, there is some speculation, and you know, this is 80 years later, and I wasn't there, I don't know. Uh, I don't mean to uh, cast aspersions on the uh, Texas officers, but there, there was some allegation that they went in there and killed them, and then concocted this story that the young brothers shot each other. It came out in the paper that they shot each other in the bathroom. And two boys, Paul and er, Jennings and Harry. And uh, but a Texas Ranger told my dad that they they had them cornered in the bathroom, and they kicked the door down, and turned the machine gun loose on. What sort of a person was Willie Florence? Was she more Ma Barker or misguided but protective mother? Reports that she charged fees for those wanting to take tours of the house following the massacre may make it difficult to consider her in a sympathetic light, even with the Great Depression in mind. Uh, Mrs. Young, uh, she eventually sold the farm. She had to. Uh, I guess there were all sorts of lawyers' bills to pay and stuff like this. She had to sell the farm. Uh, she moved in and ran a boarding house. She died the day before they dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima in 1945. Uh, died a, a broken old woman and, uh, you know, alone. Uh, none of her children were with her. And, uh, you know, she's a sad story. You know, I mean, I know a lot of people, you know, they, they you know, portrayed her, like I said, as this Ma Barker type character, you know, and, and who's to say she may have been. But I have a funny feeling she was just a poor old mother who didn't know how to handle her children and, uh, you know, probably dried grief stricken. In what of Woodside's book? Depending who is asked, it should either be largely dismissed or considered the most reliable source of information. It's difficult to think that certain conversations quoted in the book could have possibly been recorded with the precision they are presented. In opinions and religious views, Woodside reveals in the book cast a shadow over the facts recorded, though a careful reading of the book can separate one from the other. The, uh, the book that was first published was published a year after uh, the massacre, and it was actually published, uh, it never was copyrighted, and uh, it was just really a kind of a compilation of newspaper articles. I can't remember who the real author was. It may have been a man named George Olds. He was a newspaper writer, and he just used Woodside as kind of a pseudonym, you know. And it had, it was obviously written in an environment of uh, hostility. Uh, people, I, I don't think it's possible for us to imagine the anger and the hatred that was directed toward the Youngs uh, even a year later. Uh, over this massacre. I mean, it was just, you know, it was a serious, serious situation for this people of Springfield. And uh, it was just chock full of, of rumors. And uh, for instance, the story goes, you know, that Willie Florence and uh, James David were first cousins. That That's totally erroneous. You know, they weren't, they weren't related at all. 
uh, the implication, of course, being that being first cousins married, some of their children probably weren't quite, you know, with them. Uh, you know, there was there was all sorts of stories written out there. And again, you have to take everything that Woodside says with a grain of salt. That being said, it is still the contemporary source. It was written, you know, at the time. Uh, and he probably interviewed a lot of people. And some of the interviews were extremely important. And uh, he probably had more facts right than wrong. But nevertheless, you always, you have to, you have to read it through a filter of the of the times, so uh, I I uh, I use Woodside as a source, but I always try to collaborate everything that he said because frankly, uh, there's some of it that probably is I, I know is not true. Yeah. What is known without question is that on January second, nineteen thirty two, America lost the most peace officers due to gunfire in a single event in our nation's history outside of a farmhouse in Brookline, Missouri. I would think that having been an officer, I would want it to be remembered. And just as a, as a person who's interested in history myself and who, who worked in law enforcement for uh, two decades, I think uh, they deserve to be remembered. They, they paid the ultimate sacrifice in the performance of their duties. And I think that every time something like this happens, we can learn from it. I think they would want people, even this, this long after the fact, to learn the important lessons of what happened that day. In simple words, they unfold the tragedy that left six wives and a score of children without a defender and bread earner. That shocked a whole nation of people and bowed every head in the Ozarks region with grief and humiliation. John R. Woodside, 1932, regarding Springfield newspapermen following the massacre.